I want to thank East Hampton Library for letting us use this beautiful room. I want to thank LTV for coming and, and uh, filming for us every month. This is the final one of our winter lecture series. Um, the series this year has been uh, because of the 275th anniversary of the town of East Hampton, the English settlement in the town of East Hampton. We know there were here people here before the English settlers came. So there were here, people here for hundreds of years, but this is the 275th anniversary of the English settlement of East Hampton. 370th, I'm sorry, 375th. I'm so old now, I can't remember anything. Um, so. <laughs> Um, just a couple notes I wanted to make um, after the thank yous. I want to remind everybody, if you're not already members of the East Hampton Historical Society, we value your memberships. It's the memberships of our, our, all our members. It's the money that we get from memberships that allow us to do these programs for free. So please, if you're not already a member, it's not a lot of money to join every year, and we really value your membership. Um, the, the, the um, theme of this year's lecture series had to do with the people who built East Hampton. Unfortunately, there are no women mentioned, and we know what they were doing. They were busy raising the next generation, so we know what they were doing, but at some point, we're gonna do a whole series on the women's contributions in East Hampton. I promise you that. I also want to mention that we're always looking. We've been doing these lectures now for about 20 years, this series. So if you have an idea of something that you would like to hear about that you haven't, that we haven't touched on yet, something specific to the East Hampton history, please see me afterwards, or Steve. Steve is over here, our, our director, or Hillary over here, who's our president. See one of us and give us a suggestion, because we're always looking every year. Hugh and I sit down together and try to come up with a theme for the year. We'd love to hear your ideas. Now, tonight's lecture is, we've already heard about blacksmiths, we've heard about millers, we've heard about whalers. Tonight, we're hearing about builders, architects, builders, and tools of the 19th and 20th century. Hugh King and Evan Thomas have both been very generous over the years to do lectures for us. Everybody knows Hugh. Hugh's one of our uh, town treasures. I was going to say national treasure, but I don't know if you go quite that far. Um, but he's one of our local treasures here in East Hampton. <laughs> um, Evan Thomas has been a master carpenter since the 1980s and, and will tell you a lot about the tools that he has up here. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what they have to say and I thank you all for coming. Well, thank you for coming. That's it. <laughs> Okay, um, I want to thank uh, Andrea Meyer and Julia Tyson and uh, Mariah Moore for putting these images together. Um, and of course, I want to thank Scott. He's going to be here when I mess up the, uh, the thing that moves the pictures. But tonight's lecture could not be done without this book, East Hampton's Heritage, uh, edited by Robert Hefner with um, essays by Clay Lancaster and Robert A. M. Stern. Uh, in this book, Bob has documented 34 builders and 56 architects. So I think by 11.30, we should be <laughs> book, okay? Bob's next lecture, by the way, will be making all the corrections from what I've said tonight. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if any of you went to David Catalato's wonderful talk down at the Life Saving Station in Coast Guard. And what David was smart, what he did was he sang as you came in, so he woke you up. And then as the lecture was going on, when he was worried about it flagging, he had you say either whale off or there she blows, all right? We can't do that tonight, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to speak about a builder and an architect, and just about the time you get bored with that, Evan's going to come up and talk about the tools. And then when you begin, and you will be getting bored, uh, Evan's tools, when that ends, I'm going to come back and do another architect and another builder. And if you're lucky, there'll be no time for questions, okay? Okay, there he is, Joseph Greenleaf Thorpe, okay? He's our first uh, architect. Joseph Greenleaf Thorpe, architect here for many years, died at Southampton Hospital of pneumonia late Tuesday night after a brief illness. He was taken to the hospital on Monday morning. Services were held at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Robert Barnes, where Mr. Thorpe had lived. On Thursday afternoon, a burial followed the next morning in the Rosedale Cemetery, Orange, New Jersey. Uh, the 
service was conducted by Reverend Ernest E. Eels, pastor of the Presbyterian Church. Now, Mr. Thorpe was born 71 years ago. This is 1934. Um, born uh, 71 years ago in East Orange, New Jersey, the son of George Washington Thorpe and the former Anna Greenleaf. So his middle name was his mother's maiden name. I sat until I saw this. He was educated at Princeton University. After engaging in architectural work in New York, for several years he came to East Hampton to reside permanently. The first summer, his parents rented the Joseph S. Osborne house. You know where that is? It's on the corner of Dayton Lane and Main Street. And Joseph Septimus Osborne should be the subject of a whole, a whole talk all by himself. Okay? That house, by the way, is still standing, okay? The first summer, his parents rented the Joseph Osborne house. Mr. Thorpe built his own home on Woods Lane, which is still standing, which you're going to see, where he lived with his mother and sister until 1910 when he sold it to Mr. and Mrs. Lewis Bach. He later owned the Sam Miller house. <coughs> where was that? <coughs> Sam Miller, we think, was one of the actors who appeared at, in uh, theatrical events at Clinton Hall. And he lived on the corner of Dunmere Lane and Main Street, the Sam Miller House. And that was sold when the old hall was built. And can you imagine the guy who owned the house actually appeared in theater events, we think, across the street. OK. Um, as an architect here, Mr. Thorpe designed many of the summer colony houses. Among them of those Dr. J. Newitt Steele, Windward on Lily Pond Lane for John Dr. John A. Paxton, the E.G. Potter property, the Clifford H. McCall house, and the home of Mrs. Garrett Hobart. Well, her name wasn't Mrs. Garrett Hobart, that terrible way that they used to identify women by their husband's name. Her actual name was Jenny Tuttle Hobart. But she's not the important one here. Garrett Hobart is. Garrett Hobart changed the course of American history. He actually changed the course of world history. How he did it? He died. All right? <laughs> Garrett Hobart was the vice president under William McKinley. It, here we come for the election of 1900. Garrett Hobart dies. Now, the Boss Platt and the other uh, influential leaders in New York State wanted Teddy Roosevelt out of here. You know, he was the governor, but he wouldn't listen. Okay? So they were going to propose him to be the vice presidential candidate. He apparently doesn't want it at the beginning. Mark Hanna, who was the um, manager of McKinley's complaint, didn't want him either. And, but Roosevelt finally acquiesced and he ran. And what happens? McKinley gets assassinated. Now Teddy Roosevelt's president of the United States. And that's all because of Garrett Hobart. All right. <laughs> he also designed the home of Dr. Dudley Roberts. Now, Dudley Roberts did many great things, but the big thing he did, we're taking care of it right now. In 1946, when they were going to tear down, they were tearing down the Dominey House, he went down there and got the, uh, the uh, clock shop and the carpenter shop, brought it up to his property on Further Lane. And then later on, he, he, was going to, he tried to give it to the Historical Society. And then, when they designed Winterthur Museum, in Delaware, they wanted those clock shops and the, and the clock shop and the carpenter shop. He didn't give it to them. So he saved them twice. And what's going on right now? They're being restored down there on North Main Street. Um, okay, so Joseph Greenleaf Thorpe. Okay, let's leave him now. Now, what else did he do? He remodeled Alec Baldwin's home on, um, on, on Town Lane, that house. Uh, 1913, that house was remodeled. He was the uh, designer for that. Um, okay, now I'm going to move. Oh, I'm going to use this now. Heads up. Is it on? Is it on? It's on. Okay, here we go. Let's see if I can move. Move it. Ah! All right. This is Oddfellows Hall. Um, Odd Fellows Hall was built, they built about 1899 or 1897. It was painted green, you know, at one time. Um, the first village election took place in Odd Fellows Hall. Now, the meeting to decide 
decide to have a village took place at Clinton Hall. But the first village election took place in Oddfellows Hall. Um, when the, co the community decided to, whether they were going to purchase Home Sweet Home Museum in 1927, the uh, election was held at Oddfellows Hall. Um, it was also a polling place for village and town elections. And it was a primary school at one time. And now, the, in 1922, they had a vote in East Stanton whether they were going to build a new school, which I'm going to get to later. That vote took place in Oddfellows Hall. And then between Evan Frankel and Deborah Perry wound up owning Oddfellows Hall at one time. And then Gordon Peavy was on the top floor with his ballet and exercise class. Don't take it. It was awful. He was so tough. All right. And then one day, Loretta and I were in there, she was visiting Deborah, and Blanche Wiesencook was in Oddfellows Hall. She wrote the definitive biography of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, one of the definitive biographies. And Deborah, I think, was helping her. OK? All right. Now I'm, we're going to move ahead. Ooh, there it is, Miller Papendiak Poorhouse. OK, that's still standing, of course. Uh, this was a site of Thomas Baker's Ordinary in 1650. In 1855, there was a Miller house there. It was renovated in 1911 um, to, because we had this huge movement in the early 20th century to everything Maidstone. We were, there was a movement to rename our community Maidstone, and this was, this was designed in that, in that tenor. We had, you know, when Frederick Gallatin said he was going to sell that land in Springs for one dollar for a park, it had to be called Maidstone Park. The Maidstone Club, when it was formed, they decided they wanted to tell everybody how they were to the roots of the founding of our town, so they named it the Maidstone Club. The Maidstone Hotel, that burned down. Um, we have, still have the Maidstone Arms. Um, and then the wedding of Eleanor Papendak to William Thorpe took place here, and they had this big, I can't think of the word, it was like a, a, a path that went from that house all the way over to St. Luke's Church. Um, okay, and then the wisteria at Home Sweet Home is over 100 years old. Well, if you go behind there, you're going to see wisteria older than that. The wisteria behind there, they also have white wisteria, okay? All right, this is Joseph Greenleaf Thorpe's house, right? There on Woods Lane, still there, right? Okay. All right. This is Lorenzo E. Woodhouse the Fens, designed by Joseph Greenleaf Thorpe. Okay, now. Um, this house was demolished in 1949. The late great Inez Whipple didn't, was very circumspect of what she said, but she had no use for their son Doug. Because Douglas convinced them, convinced Mrs. Woodhouse to tear this place down, all right? Uh, Lorenzo Woodhouse was the first president of the East Stamp Historical Society. He got Mr. Buke, uh, Gustav Buke, who owned Home Sweet Home, he got him to join. Um, both the Woodhouses, of course, were important in the library, the renovation of Clinton Academy, and Mary Woodhouse, of course, with Guild Hall and the Nature Trail, okay? All right, now we got Edward M. Gay, okay? Here we go. I'm going to read his obituary, so you don't have to read that. Okay. Edward Michael Gay, highly respected resident of this village, died at his residence on Hunting Lane on Tuesday morning after being in poor health for about a year. He was 63 years of age, having been born in East Hampton on August 20th, 1870. He was the son of Michael and Anne Reed Gray. His illness forced his retirement from Actus Business. This is 1933, by the way. His uh, illness forced his retirement from Actus Business several months ago, but in spite of his poor health, he managed to drive around to view his work, which, was, which his employees were doing. He was able to take daily rides up until a short time. Several days before his death, he lapsed into a coma and died during his sleep. He established his own contracting business after 25 over 25 years ago, this is from 1933, and was one of the most prominent building contractors in Suffolk County, being president of the Suffolk County Builders Association. His contracting firm built some of the largest summer co colony houses in East Hampton. There 
During one building season, he built the new homes of Frederick Cody, Grantland Rice, and the late Ring Lardner. A man of sound business judgment and whose integrity was of the highest, Mr. Gay occupied many positions of trust in the business world. He was president of the Hamptons Hotel Corporation and the director of the Osborne Trust Company and the Home Water Company. Mr. Gray will be greatly missed, uh, greatly missed by his wife's circle of friends. As a businessman of long standing, he was always ready to willing to do his part. He was a member of the village board, having been served from October 30th, 1920, when the village was incorporated and re-elected several times, serving until June 27. He was one of the directors of the Neighborhood Association. By the way, the Neighborhood Association is the one who gave Herrick Park to the village. Herrick Park belongs to the village, not to school, as we all thought growing up. Okay. Former member of the East Stanton Lions Club and the East Stanton Businessmen's Club. Funeral services were conducted yesterday from the Presbyterian Church with Reverend Ernest E. Eels and Reverend Oscar, P., uh, Oscar Treader of Harrisburg, a former rector of St. Luke's. The church was crowded with friends. His pallbearers were six friends he had known since boyhood. Herbert T. Barnes, Royal Luther, Everett J. Edwards, Norman Barnes and James M. Strong. Okay, all right, now. All right, oh boy, here we go. This is one of my favorites. All right, Steve, Steve Long found this for us, okay? This is, I just couldn't believe that this existed, okay? Oh, I'm going to use the pointer. Oh, wait a minute. No, you don't, okay. Right there on the left is the Osborne Lamb House. Right next to it is the Edwin M. Gay, um, his shop. And then right next to that is the East Hampton School, okay? So I'm thinking, who built the East Hampton School? Um, okay, okay. So what happens is in 1922, the, the uh, taxpayers uh, of the, uh, the district decide they want to build a new school. Remember, in 1894, there was a union school on this spot. It was a wooden building and a brick building. So they get rid of the wood, wooden building, and then the children have to go to school and what le was left of the brick building. Then they went to the Session House, Oddfellows Hall, and the Methodist Meeting House, which I think was the whole school, okay? The bids were not to exceed $250,000. Now, the bidding, were for, there were five bidders, and four of them were from out of our town, okay? So the, the, all the bids came in too much. So they decided, well, maybe we should have a meeting and decide if we're going to spend more money than the, uh, the 250. We're going to ask for $50,000 more. Listen to this meeting. Here we go. The proposition to raise an additional amount of $50,000 for the new school building was defeated Saturday night at Oddfellows Hall by the small majority of eight. The vote was taken, uh, not taken until the question had been discussed at some length, both pro and con. The opposition developed from two sources. One of them, the largest delegation of summer cottagers ever registered here at public meeting, summer people, and local residents. Two of the local residents who were against it was Samuel A. Gregory. He actually became the mayor of the village of East Hampton. And Dr. F.K. Hollis, so you'll hear more about him. Any votes, it believed, were gained for the opposition because statements of the speakers were left pr practically unrefuted. One of the summer residents, when talked with a few days later about the proposition, stated that she had been told that the school was going to be completed and it would cost $400,000. Guess what? Misinformation, alternative facts. Sound familiar? Here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. The matter of a different site for the pros building was brought up several times. The principal objection to the old site, it seemed, on account of the traffic. This is 1923. <laughs> the traffic on Newtown Lane? Okay. And then people got mad because they didn't take the offer of Vitaults. The Vitaults had some land that they offered, but it couldn't have been across the street. That wouldn't have made any difference. Okay. So they, uh, that got turned down. And who got to bid to build the house? Edward M. Gay, thank heaven, he was right next door, okay? Okay, now this building, okay, hold it, hold it, hold it. Okay. The other thing about the school is the gymnasium, okay? And the school. I don't know how many of you go, went to uh, East Ham High School, right? 
right? Right. The gymnasium. On one end was the stage. Now, you've got to remember this for later, okay? And on the other end, on the, behind the basket, there was room for seats and for chairs. Okay, now remember that, it's coming up later. Okay, okay. now we've got to hear about Marvin Conklin. Okay, you ready? Uh, e. Marvin Conklin of East Hampton died at South Hampton Hospital. Mr. Conklin was born in 1898 in Bridgehampton. The family moved to East Hampton after World War I. One. Mr. Conklin served with the infantry in France during the war and was a past commander of the American Legion post here. He also served with the Army Engineers in World War II. He worked as a carpenter till he fell from a roof and broke his hip. <coughs> After that, he served as a superintendent for many years for his uncle, the late Edwin M. Gray, Gay, a contractor. So after Gay dies, Conklin builds a little store, and that store was right next to the school. Danny Talmadge t told me it was the driveway, where the driveway of the middle school is now. That was I never got to go there because you came from Amagansett, and you, you, the bus pulled you in, and you had to go to school. Um, so I, I never ate there. I don't know. Was it any good? Probably not. Okay. All right. Now we're moving ahead. Uh, let's go to the next place. All right. The George W. Sherman House. Okay. Okay. George Sherman was a lawyer in the firm of Charles Evan Hughes. And the reason I'm telling you this is because. Fourth of July parade, Charles Evan Hughes is running for president. And he shows up in East Hampton and he gives a speech on Mill Hill. You know, where, where that tree is at the end of Mill Hill Lane. He gave a speech. I said, well, how did he get here to East Hampton? I think because George Sherman may have invited him to give a speech here. Okay? Okay. Uh, but George Sherman is not really important, but his brother Jacob is. Brother Jacob was appointed, you ready? After the Spanish-American War, we've kicked Spain out of Cuba, and then we've kicked them out of the Philippines, okay? But the Philippines had an insurgent of about 30,000 people who were fighting the Spanish. So the United States decided, well, they're not really ready for independence yet, so let's send a commission down there. And Jacob Gould Sherman was appointed the head of that commission. And he made so many recommendations, basically saying, we have to let the Philippines you know, decide for themselves. He was ignored, so he quit. And then the United States was fighting these insurgents uh, for quite a time, OK? OK, now, this house uh, was purchased by Jackie Kennedy Onassis' grandparents, Major John Verno Bouvier, Bouvier, Jr. It was called La Sada, meaning place of peace. Included on the grounds were a stable, tack room, jumping rink, and a paddock. Jackie played here until she was about 12. And she also lived at Rowdy Hall, right? Well, right behind this place is the East Ham Writing Club, I think. And of course, she rode over there, too. OK? OK. All right, this is John E. Helmhouse. I couldn't find out a lot about him. He was an engineer. His parents were born in Germany. And according to the 1920 census, he could read and write. <laughs> That's it. OK. Here's a big mistake. OK, watch this one. Wallace Reed House. All right. Wallace Reed was an early silent film star. He was a singer, a race car driver, and made over 100 silent films and over 60 full-length features and was considered a matinee idol. He tried to qualify for the Indianapolis 500, it appeared, and if you look in the, uh, the star in advertisements for the Edwards Theater, not the one that was built in 26, but the other one, he's appearing in shorts here in East Hampton, okay? He was injured in a train wreck and became addicted to morphine. Unfortunately, that's not the Wallace Reed who built this house. <laughs> Wallace Reed was a member of the Maidstone Club. He had a long career in insurance. Um, he owned his own insurance company. He attended City College, was a former trustee of the Franklin Savings Bank. He was a member of the Maidstone Club, the New York Yacht Club, the Grolier Club, the Union Club, and everything else, Devon Town Association. All right, and the last one I'm going to talk about. No, the last two. Sorry, one more. All right, Robert Appleton. Okay, okay, Robert Appleton. Robert Appleton dies in a fall at Palm Beach. News of the death of Robert Appleton came as a shock to East Stanton people this week. Mr. Appleton died 
die in the fall from the sixth floor of a hotel in Palm Beach about five o'clock in the afternoon. Mr. Appleton was 73, once a real estate man, retired many years ago. He had a, an estate on the dunes, uh, Nid de Papillon, maintained a home at the Hotel Plaza in New York in Palm Beach. He was a member of the Bath and Tennis Club in Palm Beach, the Devon Yacht Club, the Regency Club. He was president of the Riding Club of East Hampton, you know, where Gertz and Stern was. His second president took an active part, part in the annual horse shows. Okay. The Paul Bears at his funeral, N. N. Tiffany, I. Y. Halsey, Kenneth Davis, Louis Vitor, Frank Smith, and Percy Skank, P.C. Skank. Okay. That's not the end of Robert Appleton. Because now we have a $25,000 theft of gems reported at Appleton's home. Early morning robbery while family sleeps. People were called to the Robert Appleton estate at 4 a.m. yesterday and were reported that, by Mr. to Mrs. Appleton that jewelry valued in excess of $25,000 and a single note of $100 had been taken from Mrs. Appleton's dressing room. Mr. Appleton feeling a draft through an open door of his bedroom which adjoins Mrs. Appleton. Open, he saw a man hiding his face with his arm, running in a crouching position from the closet of the room. The burglar slammed the glass door in the hall, which wakened Mrs. Appleton, ran downstairs, and out the door on the ocean side of the house. Okay? Now, also, I never found anything here, by the way. The last thing about Robert Appleton is he had a polo field up there. Uh, but the other thing about that was one trip, and his friends were landing airplanes up there in Further Lane. Well, you can imagine what those Further Laners thought of that. So that was the impetus to begin talking about an airport here in East Hampton. And, uh, and finally, okay, one more. And, uh, okay, yeah. Evan's coming next, so you can wake up. Okay, now. Dr. F. Hallister dies at his Drew Lane residence. That's, this is his house. Uh, Hollister was well-known resident of East Stanton since 1901 when he spent his first summer here. He died at his Drew Lane residence early Sunday morning following a ling lingering. Dr. Hollister retired from practice in 1920 and subsequently passed most of his time to travel, making up his one trip around the world. He was in his sixth year. Um, he was one of the organizers of the East Stanton Associate, a group organized to protect the interests of some The present hearings conducted by the Public Service Commission regarding alleged excessive rates charged by the local lighting company follow, following work done along this line by the East Stanton Associates. Dr. Hollister was also one of the East Stanton residents who took the lead in raising money to secure East Hampton's first ambulance. Okay? Okay. That's it for me, Evan. You're on. Wake up, Evan. Guys, hear me? Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So, what I'm more interested, my focus is uh, the progression of building and how it changes from one century to the other, and uh, the um, the changeover from the uh, right at the end of the 19th century is particularly interesting because every th the way houses were built is going to completely change. Uh, before that, I mean, you've heard a lot of times that people would move a house from place to place because it was really a very valuable thing. Uh, by the time these builders and architects came around, they would just raise a house and build another one because everything was different. So I want you first to consider what it was like uh, in the earliest part of the 19th century. Uh, there are maybe one or two lumber mills in the United States. There's a hydro Howard one in Pennsylvania, but pretty much all the wood was cut by human power. Uh, this will give you an idea. This is from the Domini estate. You have one person on one side, one on the other, and they will saw through a piece of white oak. I'm imagining each cut will take a couple of hours. All right, so these, these guys, they didn't have motorized joiners. They didn't have planers. Saws, routers, they didn't have electric sanders, um, they didn't have plywood, uh, not because plywood hadn't been invented. Uh, the Egyptians were using it in 
3500 BC. Um, still the first. It just was very hard to make, and uh, it just wasn't commercially available. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we have a couple of these mills running on hydropower. They're doing great, uh, mostly on human muscles. And even when they saw the wood, it was what's known as rough sawn. Um, woodworking is a very tactile thing, so I'm going to let you guys handle things, just hand them back and then hand them over the other side. So this is rough sawn lumber. This is what it looks like, what it feels like. And this is close to what they would get. But they wanted it to look like this. So just pass them around, take your time. Um, they're unbreakable. <laughs> so, so, okay, so how do you get your lumber, which is, you know, I, we've all seen rough hewn lumber. How do you get that into a finished product? Uh, and the way we would do it is um, up until electricity and computers, there were six basic tools. Okay, there, I don't know how many you're familiar with. So there's, the first one is uh, the inclined plane. It looks like a doorstop. Uh, but it's actually quite important because this is a way you can raise things up to a higher level without having to actually lift them. And also, this is how you can move things for instance, a plane, because now you're getting much, much more torque because you're working down at the angle. So this is our first most important. And keep in mind, these tools have been around before 350 BC. All right, so if you take an inclined plane and then you add a wedge to it, so the wedge is your second basic tool. It's basically just a piece of metal which has been sharpened, ground on a whetstone, to an angle. Very, very simple. Now, once you grind it on a whetstone, uh, I'm sorry, grind it on a grindstone, and then hone it on a whetstone, it becomes sharp enough that you can actually start just with a hammer tapping into the hardest of woods. You can take, uh, you can take any piece of metal. I, you can get a machine, and I can make a mortise with this square piece of wood, but it's going to take about 10,000 pounds of pressure. All I have to do is to sharpen one of these babies up, and I can actually tap it with a hammer, and it will cut right into a piece of the heaviest wood. So that's our second most important one that we have around. Okay, so now the important thing about the, the wedge is it has a, a lot of uses because you make shingles out of it, tapping them out of the thing. You can use it, in this case, as a smoothing plane. Um, and it's invaluable for making uh, mortise and tenon because most of our older houses are mortise and tenon. That's also how they were strong enough to be able to be moved around. All right, so then we have number three, very important. The third basic tool is the screw. Actually, first used in Egyptian times uh, for irrigation. It was actually used for pulling up water. Uh, but we use it for everything from drill. all drill bits or screws. Uh, what else is a screw? Um, another good example of a screw, which is here, all our clamps, early clamps, are screws. And without clamps, we no, we can't glue anything together. We have a saying in the woodworking. There's very little that 2,000 pounds of pressure won't cure. So, uh, there are three other basic tools. They're probably the most important one, which is the wheel and axle. Uh, you will find builders using that mainly for transport, but also even a simple uh, wood lathe with a hand-powered wood lathe would use that. Uh, and also a pulley, which obviously increases the amount of man or animal power by depending on how many pulleys you actually have. So these are the basic ones. Um, oh, and the last one, of course, is the lever. Um, the lever is, well, if you're ever taking a nail out of a piece of wood, but even the, the act of hammering is actually almost a sense of the lever. So these are the tools you have. Basically, your woodworking shop. Um, you know, you can think if, if you want to. I'm not going to bore you with it. 
that everything based, is based on these six tools. Uh, but they have drawbacks, these tools. I mean, uh, the, the first one, of course, is that almost all of them are run by human power. So they're limited by the power of one, two, three, four men. The other thing is, in the case of these tools, they take a long time to master. They take a long time to build. I mean, if you're going to build, let's say, if you're going to do mortise and tenon, you've got to be really good. These are back saws. You have to be really good at cutting the shoulders on a saw. You have to be very good. So it's, it took a lot of time to learn these things. Um, and you know, these are not easy to sharpen, and they have to be sharpened. These are not easy to keep tuned up. This is interesting enough. This is, this is my go-to everyday actually an antique plane from the 20s. It's no different than the plane the, uh, the 1920s. It's no different than the planes people would have 50 years earlier. It's very simple. You just have to know how to take care of them, but it's not easy taking care of them. And that's, this is just for making stuff square. Now, what if someone gets this wild, crazy idea that they're going to make moldings? something decorative. And to give an example of, I want you to think of how many planes are in a shop. So you got a long plane. I was going to bring it in, but it's just too heavy, which is a joining plane. It's for making the wood straight enough that you can glue it together. Then you have a jack plane for removing stock um, and taking the cup out of board. And then you get the molding planes, the rabbiting planes. So I'll just, just throw these out. This is a coving plane. This is a molding plane. This is a rabbiting plane. Uh, this is a bead and quirk. Uh, another kind of molding, another kind of molding. You need a lot of planes, basically. Every plane is hand built. Every piece of metal, the knife, is hand ground, hand sharpened. This was not easy to make. That's why if you look at the Domini furniture, it has very little ornamentation. That's why if you look at Clinton Academy, most of the moldings are just rectangular moldings. It's all very much like in the Shaker style. Making a molding took a lot of time. Uh, and a matter of fact, the making of a plane was a very important part of um, a young apprentice's journey because uh, to go up from journeyman to, uh, from, from, sorry, apprentice to journeyman, journeyman to master, you had to produce a piece. And so from apprentice to journeyman, you usually had to make a complicated plane. And uh, this is a very complicated uh, dadoing plane. The dado is a groove in a wood that you use to attach other people. But I want you guys to get a sense. There is some sharp metal on that. So. Be careful. Um, all right, so, so in the beginning of the 19th century, things had to be pretty simple. And you were very much limited. Uh, and we also, um, we also had other problems, too, which was getting wood. But we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So OK, 19th century comes around and brings with it the Industrial Revolution. And that's a huge deal, because now we have something. We have steam power. Now we no longer depend on water power, which is fairly good, but not as great. Steam power is very powerful. Uh, and it's especially good for lumber mills, uh, because aside from the fact that it can make a thousand-fold times the board footage in a single day, the symbiotic relationship between the wood and the lumber and the steam, because you're using the cutoffs from the very trees to produce the steam, which powers the lumber yard. So it's a great closed um, and so uh, after a while, uh, they start in Scotland, but they got here later. We also had uh, steam-powered uh, joiners. A joiner is something which flattens the bottom of a board. And then steam-powered planers, which flattens the top after the bottom. And then uh, shingles. Shingles was a huge thing. You used to have to hand hew every shingle out of a block of cedar. Now you have these machines, just put a block of cedar there, boom, one thing comes down. 
you of hundreds of shingles. So it was a big deal. Flooring just is anyone who has ever, I mean, now that you can produce plywood, has anyone who ever tried to put a parquet floor on a rough hewn timber, which I think is impossible, um, this is a huge, huge deal that you can actually lay down plywood. And that means you could have these fancy parquet floors or parquet, or you could just have tongue and groove flooring, which was a big deal too. Uh, uh, and you look at the old buildings and you can basically see the floor downstairs uh, when the wood shrinks and expands. And uh, then there were the moldings. I mean, now they would just make up the knives and they would run the thing and you could have any shape of molding. And moldings that used to be, you know, the grand houses of Europe, which were handmade, now you could have them in the summer houses of the Hamptons. Uh, the other big change that happened was the availability of lumber. Uh, the East End, we have woods and stuff like that. We don't have a forest out here. Uh, our oak is fairly scrubby. I'd say the only real cash wood we have out here is chestnut. Um, they went through that pretty quickly. Um, as a matter of fact, I think Hugh was telling me a story that when they went to build some building, they had to get all the wood on Gardner's Island. They were already out of wood in the East End. So, but in the 19th century, they went up to the Adirondacks. Fast. The Adirondacks is a forest in the middle of the state of New York. It is one fifth the territory of New York State. It is three times as big as Yellowstone Park. It has great primary growth of many trees from walnuts to choke cherry, but mainly it's got oak. Lots and lots of oak. White oak, red oak. And oak is a great wood for building things. Um, it hadn't been that popular, but once it started being, uh, entire schools of furniture came around oak furniture. That's the stickly furniture, the green, green and green. So all of a sudden, we had access to a lot of wood. What they did up in Albany is they built a lot of the lumber mills around that. In the winter, they would have horse-drawn sleds so they could go into the middle of the forest. With a sled on the snow and ice, you didn't need roads. You could just get right in there. You fell the trees. Back to Albany, steam powered uh, lumber mill, cuts them all up. You have to dry them for about a year. As you know, you can't use wet lumber, it expands, contracts, it cuts. And then they just float them down on a barge to New York City. Uh, sometimes they would take them from New York City on a boat to Sag Harbor. But then that changed uh, because in, I think it's 1870, uh, the railroad came out to Bridgehampton. Now everything could be transported. Then someone was smart enough to build a lumber yard pretty much where Riverhead Building Supply is now. And uh, in another 25 years, they brought the railroad right out to where that lumber yard is. And now you could just offload straight from the train. You didn't have to hire one of the, the many stages that went between Hampton and Bridgehampton. So now you've got unlimited supply of building materials, moldings, they're cheaper, they're more available, and we get a building boon. And why not? You can build now fantastically large and ornate houses. Um, they're less and architects could have a lot more fun with stuff. It, just, it wasn't just simple and, you know, rectangles and angles. Um, and that's pretty much one of the main things that created this, this new boom in uh, building houses, especially summer houses. The only question I have, and I'm going to bring this up later, is I've not been able to find out where all the new workers came from. I mean, there were, there were always craftsmen out here. There were always people who built houses, but they were building a couple a year, and all of a sudden they were building these uh, gigantic buildings. Uh, this coincides with a time when there was a lot of immigration to New York City, and especially a lot of artisans in this uh, They were built by this influx of Italian artisans and very, um, it could be some sort of offshoot from that because uh, Austin Corbin, uh, Corbin, Corbin used a lot of Italian labor to build the, uh, the 
tracks for the LIRR. Perhaps some of these people decide to stick around. Uh, or, uh, well, if, if they did, they weren't starting their own companies because I looked back and the companies the, were all, the, the, the people who ran the companies were all named Gay, Barnes, Eldridge. So, uh, and then there's also just a chance that a lot of people decided that building was more lucrative But anyway, uh, that pretty much began the biggest building boom that, if I'm not mistaken, is still going on today. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. All right. Okay, I also, I did. I forgot to tell you this. Edward M. Gay built the Spring School, the 1931 school. Remember, Ashawa Hall was used as a school, but by 1909, it was too small. So one of the people I'm going to talk about next, George Eldridge, built a wooden school um, on School Street. Um, that burned down in 1929, and then Edward M. Gay built the four-room schoolhouse, which stayed in Springs until 1960, when they um, added on and brought the seventh and eighth grade students back. John Custis Lawrence. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. John Custis Lawrence. Okay. John Custis Lawrence, 76, architect, many years, dies here. This is 1944. John Custis Lawrence died on Saturday morning at his home on the Bridgehampton Road after an illness of two years. He had been confined to his bed for the past three months. Mr. Lawrence was born November 22nd, 1867, at First House in Montauk. Son of Captain John B. and Nancy Edwards Lawrence. His father was shipwrecked at Amagansett in bitter winter weather. The parents of his future wife cared for him till he recovered from the shock of the experience. Captain Lawrence became keeper of one of the first three historic houses in Montauk, around which cattle from eastern Long Island were driven annually. Uh, he was also the first life saving station keeper on Hither Plain, Montauk. First house burned to the ground some years ago. Well, it Lawrence went to sea at the age of 14 on yachts and fishing vessels for several years. Then he came to East Ham and learned the carpenter's trade with George Eldridge, who we're going to talk about next. Uh, here he went to Connecticut to learn about the stair building trade and studied architecture, returning to East Ham to live about 50 years. 45 years ago, he began practice the profession here. He designed the hand building in 1900 and had his office there until the late 1930s, above what was then the East Stanton Star office. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Leaving there, his office was above E.M. Gay's shop on Newtown Lane. Okay? A great many of East Stanton's large summer houses were designed by uh, Custis Lawrence. Okay? Now, George Hand. The Hand building is right next door to the Lyman Beecher house. That's the Hand building. It says 1908. Well, who was George Hand? George Hand, one of the most highly respected residents in the death, um, lost one of the most highly respected residents in the death of George H. Hand a week ago Wednesday. Mr. Hand was born June 25th, 1857 in this village and was the son of George and Eliza Abigail Hand, also lifelong residents of East Stampton. Mr. Hand was born in what was at the time the home of Dr. Lyman Beecher. His early education in the local district school and later at Clinton Academy. For a time, he received instructions at Miss Swathwood's private school in this village. I had no idea where that is. We've got to find out where Miss Swathwood's had her school. Completing his education in East Ham, he attended Eastman's Business College. One of Mr. Han's early business ventures was buying the drugstore of a Mr. Barber. He formed a partnership with Dr. Edward Osborne and together they conducted the business for several years under the name of Osborne and Hand. They later sold the business to W.F. Munchmore, who then sold it to W.F. White. And White's pharmacy is still there, okay? No, it's the apothecary now, so they can charge more. <laughs> Mr. Hand made many friends in this community and was all over the county when he engaged in potato, 
data burying in Delton fertilizers. In the year 1905, he erected a business block, which is known as the hand block. That's the hand building next to uh, the, the village headquarters. And for several years, successfully conducted uh, a, a vegetable market in the building. For nearly 10 years, the East Stanton National Bank occupied the southern half of the building. Other tenants, um, called the East Stanton Star, was there at one time. Um, and the East Stanton Electric Light Company, Newt Tiffany, John Custis Lawrence, Harry Stevens, the lawyer, and J.G. Thorpe, architect. Okay, so that's George Hand. Now, well, what did he build? Well, let's see. We're leaving him, right? Oh, he designed the, the, uh, the uh, that's the hand building. I just told you about that, sorry. Okay, there it is, E.J. Edwards Drugstore, right? Uh, Edward Edwards had the structure built in 1901 by George Eldridge to house his pharmacy. The design was influenced by Renwick's addition to Clinton Academy in 1886. Eldridge and Lawrence designed the building. The interior furnishings designed by Lawrence included the ceiling of opal glass of a green shade laid in panels and a white mosaic tile floor. Tile. They're still there. The other place that had this green uh, ceiling was Kelly's Liquor Store. Uh, up the street, now it's the famous historic. 1906, the rear of the building was extended to provide room for the East Stanton's first central telephone office. Stockbroach office was on the top floor. What's the star's phone number? Who's got 001? Barbara. <laughs> the Strongs. And Helen wanted it, but she never got it. Okay, all right, here we go. Okay, now E.J. Edwards sold his business to... Oh, Rose Pharmacy, okay? Now, I right, see, if you look at the design, you see that design, and then you look at Renwick's Clinton Hall, you see, that's why it looks the way it does, the star office, they, they uh, copied that, okay. Uh, okay, the Lorenzo E. Woodhouse bungalow, okay. Loren Lorenzo and Mary Woodhouse bungalow, it's the night in 19... This building was probably for the landscape architect for her gardens. It's at the back end of her property, and one needed the swamp angel to get from this house to the gardens because there was a pond there. And they used this little boat, and they called it the swamp angel to get the gardens. There was also, I think, a tea house uh, on the property. Now, the wood houses, this is Lorenzo E. His uncle, Lorenzo G., was here already. So Lorenzo E., they come to East Sam after a lawsuit in Vermont. Douglas, their wonderful son, uh, gets married to this woman. The Woodhouses don't think that she's appropriate for him, and so she, they get a divorce. She sues the Woodhouses and wins a $125,000 award. Then they moved to East Hampton, okay? Lorenzo Woodhouse kept a boat at Three Mile Harbor and was the first in East Hampton to drive a Stanley steamer. Okay, now, now here comes something that's not so good. They had a daughter, Marjorie Woodhouse. The Woodhouses built the, um, the playhouse in 1916 for Marjorie. And she got married there in 1921. The tragic news that Mrs. Marjorie E. Leedy, she first was married to one of the Procter and Gambles, that ended in divorce, and then she married this guy named Leedy, okay? The tragic news that Mrs. Marjorie Leedy was drowned and her husband, Carter Randolph Leedy, was painfully injured on Wednesday when their automobile plunged 40 feet from the embankment into the Bronx River, which was received with great sorrow. Now, when you go to Guild Hall, uh, there's a Marjorie Woodhouse gallery in there. Uh, and I think that's because of uh, Marjorie. I think the, a lot of times the actor, they use it as a green room. Uh, I don't know what's changed. I don't know what's there now. Okay. Okay. Are we ready? Now we go to... Grantlin Rice, okay? You know. I don't know if you remember who Grantlin Rice was, but here we go. All right. Uh, Grantlin Rice, his house, uh, 1928, the house stood next to his friend Ring Lardner, another famous writer. Both houses were damaged in the hurricane of 1931. And you're ready for this? And were moved back from the beach. You can do that. Move back from the beach, okay? 
Okay, now, Grantland Rice. Grantland Rice was the dean of sports writers and a summer resident here for nearly 30 years. Column The Sport Light appeared in more than 100 papers. He recently completed his memoirs. Mr. Rice was a kindly man, gentle with a great sense of humor, which never bitter. He and Ring Lardner, Percy Hammond, John D. Wheeler became summer residents here. Mr. Lardner and Mr. Hammond pre-deceased and Mr. Wheeler died too. Now, Grantland Rice was, um, he attended the first World Series in 1905 and helped with the radio broadcast. And here's his most famous saying. Mr. Rice wrote a great deal of verse, and this is the one. When the great scorer comes to mark against your name, he'll write not won or lost, Ring Gardner was also a famous writer. He wrote about a, a, a lot about baseball until the Black Sox scandal in 1919, when the uh, eight members of the Chicago White Sox uh, were accused of uh, throwing the World Series. They were acquitted uh, because the confessions mysteriously disappeared. But uh, the new, uh, the new star, Kennesaw Mountain Land, is the new commissioner. Um, and then Mr. Gar Mr. Lardner was blacklisted during the Red Scare um, in, uh, in the 1940s and, and the 1950s. And now, we should have Frederick Cody. Okay. Then you can go back. Wait, Frederick Cody. Fred Cody. Okay. We're going to have time for questions when I get done with this, okay? If you want. Otherwise, go home. Okay. Frederick Cody was a well known resident here, the vice president of McCann Erickson of Advertising. Mr. Cody was born near Detroit, attended public schools there. He made many friends here after coming to East Sam in 1927 when he built Fairways. I guess that was the name of it, it was Fairways. Mr. Cody stayed on Further Lane overlooking the Maidstone Club golf course. Their new home here was opened with a large reception where Mr. and Mrs. Cody and their daughter, Miss Grace Cody. Sorry. No, no, we're not. I have another whole group to go. I'm sorry. Okay, so that's the Frederick Cody house. Now let's go ahead. George A. Eldridge, all right? This is the last one. Sorry, you got to sit here a little longer. George Eldridge. Okay, let me read him. By the deceased, this is 1924, by the decease of George A. Eldridge on the 25th of November, we suffered the loss of a well known and prominent businessman. He was born in Sayre Carver. His father, George, George Eldridge, was also a carpenter and a builder of more than the usual ability and skill. He married an East Stanton girl, Mary Lester, and later removed to the village and became the principal contractor in his line. George A. followed his father's occupation. Okay. Old East Stanton stock and had most of his life here. He knew the town well. National Bank was established here. He became a director. When the Union School was organized, he was chosen a member of the board. He was an Odd Fellows from Odd Fellows Hall. Okay? Now, what did he build? What did he do? You ready? Here we go. Okay, that's the George P. Kamen house. Okay? Um, George P. Kamen, she was the uh, daughter of Frederick Gallatin, and, and uh, in 1914, the Kamens sell to Lewis Borden. So the Caymans owned this house. They sell it to Lewis Borden. And in 1933, their daughter Penelope had an engagement to celebrating her appended marriage to Summit Edward Boone. Summit Edward Boone was a descendant of Daniel Boone. Miss Borden was a direct descendant of Roger Williams and a great granddaughter of Gail Borden, inventor of condensed milk. She's also the sister of Gail Borden, a member of the 1932 Olympic figure skating team. Who won the Olympic gold medal in 1932. Sonia, Sonia Henning, who'd she marry? Gardner, yeah, okay. Um, now, now, here we go. Evan Frankel purchased the house in 1959 for the Jewish Center, okay? Well, where did the Jewish congregation have their meetings before 1949? 1959. They had it at the Session House, uh, uh, right mm -hmm. next to the Presbyterian Church. The way this came about is that uh, Will Strong was a, a client of Markowitz and Zeldin. So when they wanted to find a place, they go to Will Strong, and he goes to the elders of the church, 
and they set it up and they go there every Friday night and Will Strong had the cross in the session house covered up so when the Jewish congregation had their meeting they didn't have to look at the cross and then later Dick Strong gives them a piece of uh, a vacant land in Akabonic and they sell that and then and the Presbyterian Church needed to raise $40,000 for the organ fund, the Jewish congregation contributed money to that. And that's how that worked. Okay? Now, Dick Strong, oh, wait a minute. At the session house, when they had their meetings, Benny Bergman brought the ark. You know who he is? Well, his mother had a clothing store down in North Main Street. When it closed, she opened up a restaurant in her house. Bob uh, Bergman's. That's right. That's where that comes from. Okay? Now also in 19, the 1930s at Guild Hall uh, there was a ping pong tournament. And the winner of the singles championship was Dick Strong. Okay? Now let's go back to the East Hampton High School. Remember when I told you about the gymnasium? On one end behind the basket was the stage. On the other end behind the basket, there was room for chairs, okay? It's 1959, we're playing South Hold, they're really good, and we have a terrible team, and we're beating them. Well, we had two, two magical um, helpers, okay? First, sitting on the stage, <clears throat> were the cheerleaders. Margie McElroy, Barbara Sesmikowski, Barbara Grant, Joan Ponick, Rosita Pallaby, and Sally Cook. One look at them, you're not gonna make a basket, okay? <laughs> But on the other end is our real secret weapon. <laughs> Sitting down there at the other end are Dick Strong, <coughs> Percy Skank, Big Al Cavanaro, and Eddie Skank. They made so much noise yelling at the referees and the other team that the two referees, Nick Chick and Herb Goldsmith, stopped the game and told them they were going to leave if they didn't be quiet. <laughs> we won the game. <laughs> Okay, well, that's enough of that. Okay. Okay, now, this is another story. I, this is so nice when you get, uh, you get assigned to do a, 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 a talk. You learn so much. I didn't know any of this. You ready? This is, what's this house? Gray Gardens. Gray Gardens, yes. All right. This is, this is F. Stanhope Phillips or Gray Gardens. Okay. Martha Bog Phillips, not Mrs. F. Stanhope, and her husband bought the property next to the Coast Guard station in 1890 and resolved to build a house. Well, they found out that, that some of the property was owned by the Coast Guard, so they had to get that straightened out, okay? Her husband dies in 1901. Now remember that, okay? She sells the house to Robert Hill and his wife Anna, who brought custom-built concrete walls from Spain to build an enclosed garden. What color are they? I had Ruth Bromley, the wife of Amar Embry II, to design the gardens. You know, Embry designed Guild Hall and the library. Then they sell the, uh, they sell the house to Phelan and Edith Beale in 1924, and then Phelan Beale dumps you know, Big Edie and Little Edie in the house. Okay. Well, um, Terry Wallace is taking, Terry Wallace is working at the Garden of Hill Cottage. He takes some people over to the cemetery and he's showing them the Moran Monument. And then there's Martha Bog Phillips buried with the Moran. Well, how'd she get there? Well, when Martha's husband died in 1901, his blamed Martha for contributing to his death. So she probably was on the outs with the rest of the family. Okay? She's buried with the Morans in the South End Cemetery. She was a good friend of Ruth Moran. And when Gill Hall opened in 1931, she presented the museum with a portrait of Thomas Moran by Howard Russell Baker for the Moran. Lorenzo G. Woodhouse home. This is Graycroft. This was the main house of the Graycroft estate. The original estate included a carriage house and a wind pump and a water tower. Who lives in the house? Who lived in the house where the wind pump and water tower is? Warren Whipple. Late great Inez Whipple and Warren Whipple. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Woodhouse gave the estate to Leighton Rollins to be used as an acting school. <laughs> and right to the left of um, the house is, it was the carriage house, I guess. That's where the acting school was. And they gave some performances at St. Luke's Church. And 
one of the programs, it said that little Bobby Osborne was in the show. <laughs> Bob's denied it. He said it was his sister. But I don't know. Okay. The DeWitt Talmadge. DeWitt Talmadge, of course, was the most prominent religious leader of the mid-late 19th century, rivaled only by Henry Ward Beecher. His Brooklyn Tabernacle Church burned three times. His sister married Reverend Stephen Mershon, minister of the Presbyterian Church. His home, along with Mershon's seaside cottage, was the beginning of the settlement called Divinity Hill, the summer colony. His first sermon was in the townhouse, and others were later printed in the East Stanton Star. And then we have, you know, I think the next, next house is the Daniel Talmadge house. Let me get to him. Daniel Talmadge came to East Stanton as a child in the 1850s to live with his uncle, Reverend Stephen Mershon. He returned to East Stanton in 1873 and in association with Reverend Mershon and another uncle, the Reverend T. D. with Talmadge, acquired land and built cottages for rental and sale on Lily Pond Lane and Cottage Avenue. Okay, here's a mistake. This house it was on Middle Lane, right? Uh, the, the, I think it was, um, what happened? The house was taken off in like 1980 and then rebuilt. So now I'm telling everybody, oh, Death Trap, that movie, uh, it's, part of it took place in a uh, windmill. It's not this one. <laughs> okay. okay, Sidney Lament, the director, had a house uh, in East Ham, and he filled part of the movie in East Ham at Deep Lane. Now, Deep Lane in Amagansett, where Quail Hill Farm is, there's a windmill there. Uh, I think one of the, Mr. Woodhouse may have built that, we're not sure. And also, he filmed in a windmill on Main Street. Well, that's the DeRose Cottage, which is behind the uh, Gardner House on Main Street. Okay? That's it. Now we can take questions. You can take questions for Evan, or you can go home. All right, all right, all right. Evan, come on up here. Yeah, yeah, Evan. Old business, new business. Go ahead. How would you make one of those school instruments that you're showing us? Yeah. How do they make that? How do they make these? Um, I'm not, frankly, I'm not sure. I imagine they cast it. Yeah, probably a wax cast. That's how you would generally sort of, and then they would hand sharpen it and take the burrs off of it. But um, my friend makes machine parts out here, uh, Randy Hoffman, and he usually uses a wax, me wax method. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. Good night. Oh, that's <laughs> Carpentry, what was your journey? Um, I'm actually uh, not a carpenter, I'm a furniture maker, but that's, it's okay. a little bit, um, I was, can you hear me? Because I thought yeah. you did. Yes. Um, I was uh, working in New York as an actor and uh, realized I was never going to make it. And uh, my dislike of people that, that bring on tables was out of the question. So uh, I fell in with a group called Ace Jointers and they were very, very high end. They actually did a lot of work out here. And I did the old-fashioned apprenticeship for the first year. I swept the floor and uh, sharpened tools. And then I convinced them that I was going to quit if they didn't let me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. King. Uh, I, I, anyway, I let them let me into the shop so I could learn on my own. Because no one's going to let you make a mistake on a $20,000 piece. But if it's your own piece, no one cares. Uh, and I just ended up really, really enjoying it. It's, it's a really nice way to make a living. I'm mostly retired. I have one client now, so I, you know, I work at my own pace. Sometimes they'll say, I want this, this, and this, and I'll say, well, I can get that for you by next year. I know that the glass was up to a certain point handmade. It was 
is still because you can see the little tiny imperfections in it. And you can actually still buy handmade glass in sheets for cutting if you want to get that look. Um, but I don't know much about masonry. I don't know much about pretty much strictly wood. So maybe the Healy will have someone. I agree with everything Evan said. Someone, someone who knows. I'm sorry. I just really, you know. That's my, my level. But the question he asked before is a really important one. Who worked on these houses? You know, we looked in the star, and there are, there are a license for a mason, for painters, for plumbers, but gee, there's not like 50 of them in, in the painting. So that's a great research question for somebody to fill it all. Who are the workers? And if anyone knows, I'm more, more than interested. Thank you so much. <laughs> that's good. No one hurt themselves? That's good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for